And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jim. Uh, I saw him logged in, and uh, Jim has the uh, the floor tonight for a talk about uh, uh, 3D printing. Go thank ahead, you. Jim. Hi, yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, coming to you from the uh, from my basement shop where I tinker and where my 3D printers live and all that. And what I just decided to do to make it a little easier, um, I'm going to share some photos with you to kind of explain uh, what I'm doing. Can you guys, can you see that? Yes. Yep. Okay, this is, um, let me give it a little background. I guess about four years ago, um, I stumbled on a guy in the orange hall who had a bunch of weird looking parts on the table. It turned out that the parts were part of a company called Lee Lines that was building standard gauge products in the 70s. They built an SP Daylight some streamlined passenger cars were their major, their major production items. And uh, shortly after that, uh, I got a call from Arno Bars, who you guys probably remember, was a good friend of mine. And I said, hey, Jim, I, I talked to that same guy. He, he wants to get rid of all this stuff, everything that Lee Lines had, all the tooling, the parts and all. And um, well, I'd like to go in on it with you. And so that was the deal. Uh, I ended up buying all of it because of... Um, Arno was in such bad health thing. This is 2016. And he was uh, he passed away about I don't know about six months after I picked this stuff up. But anyway, that kind of got me into the the building business and standard gauge. I I guess for the past 10 or 15 years, I've been kind of standard gauge crazy. The standard gauge module association was kind of amplified that. Uh, that is because you know those guys were running trains on a big layout. So um, as I went along, you know, I, I had to kind of learn how to make this stuff. I wasn't really all that good at anything. I was a tinkerer, um, but but by doing, you, you learn a lot. And, and I stumbled across uh, one of my first customers was was Clem Clements, and uh, I mentioned to him that uh, I picked up the standard gauge stuff and uh, that I was going to try to modify the the standard gauge daylight into an NWJ. And um, in order to do that, uh, you know, it has a it has a round dome on the front of the locomotive and the daylight has a, has a different front end. And so I go to the local library and they've got a 3D printer. And so I said, well, I could just get one of those kids to design that part. We'll print it out. We'll print that dome out and we'll stick that on the front of the daylight. So that's and I think I got a, a photo in here somewhere of it. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I don't know whether you can see all that, but the nose of that, can you see that? Wow. This is Clem's J, uh, standard gauge. That part on the front of there is a 3D printed dome and it prints in all the cutouts for the, the, the headlight and the number of boards come right out with the part. So that was like my, my intro into this. And um, so going to the library, you only got like four hours of printing at a time, which was just about enough to make that part. Uh, I started snooping around and um, those machines started to get very inexpensive. This, this machine that you're seeing here called a CR-10, it can print a part as big as 12 by 12 by 15 inches high. So pretty big envelope for standard gauge. That's uh, pretty useful. It's, this is showing it printing. It uses a, a filament can be either any color you like. In this case, it's something that approximates transparent, and it's printing out the uh, the back end of a, of a Milwaukee Road sky top uh, dome car, um, and it prints from the bottom up. It prints one layer at a time, and eventually it it builds the part up from nothing. So, next thing you know, I'm I'm online. There's, there's an out. There's a, a couple of sites out there. One called Thingiverse, where you can literally download printable parts. Uh, directly from the site for free. I end up contacting some of the people that uh, do these things. And uh, turns out a lot of smart young kids can design train parts very quickly and very inexpensively for you that you can just, you know, pick up the file in an email and go and, and print the thing with a, little, with a little bit of prep work. But this is one of the printers that I have. It was my first one. I've got a couple of different ones now, which I'll show you. Uh, but this one basically works with a filament. If you're looking on the uh, left side, it just pays off, comes through down through here. Can you see the, the, the mouse cursor? 
Okay. And then uh, there's a heater in here and it just forces the, the filament down. As this thing moves around, it builds up the part layer by layer. Works great because I can make big parts, but the resolution isn't that great. You know, it's uh, there's a lot of sanding that's needed to be done after that. Um, let me go to the next photo. This shows a close up of the part that's as it's being built. If you look carefully, you can kind of see uh, lines across where each of the layers is printed. And those are about uh, a little less than a half of a millimeter high. So now this is um, some of the newer printers I have. They use a, um, a liquid. And um, at the bottom here, underneath this vat of liquid is what looks like a cell phone screen facing up. And this thing can print the entire layer in one shot. It projects the, the light. Two seconds later, it moves up. And the beautiful thing, and prints on this plate up here. So this thing is normally down in the drink. It'll print, bob up and down, print again. The beautiful thing about these printers is they, is they can print 50, 50 micron layers. So thin that when they build up that part, uh, you can't really see any of the lines. Very, very high resolution. I'll show you some of the parts later that I'm making on this. And uh, so th this printer, to, to get something like this, like, you know, 10, 15 years ago would be like, you know, $50,000, $100,000. This printer was over, was under $600, you know, and, and it does, it's a little smaller than the other one. It's four and a half by eight by about 10 inches high, which was bigger, but it's big enough to, to do standard gauge stuff, which is, you know, my, my, you know, mania basically so this is a picture of a program that you use to uh to plan for print and what's shown here is a uh is a it's a pensy k4 that a guy designed and i bought the model from him it's got the cab cut off because i can only go 15 inches high on my old printer but this is everything that's on here will get printed layer by layer at the same time until it gets up to the very top um I know Clem has seen the K4 boiler, and I'm, I did that a while ago, and I still haven't built the engine from it, but it's, uh, it was one of my first forays into doing an entire locomotive. So this thing, um, to give you an idea, I, I made a friend in, uh, in Germany, and he's a big Pennsylvania railroad nut. He's a young guy, and he's a prolific modeler. This is, uh, I mean, you guys remember, the, the GM Aero train. It was um, <clears throat> developed by General Motors, EMD in the mid 50s. Um, there's a famous Pensy calendar that has this on it. It was supposed to be a lightweight train. They actually used bus bodies that they widened for the coaches. Um, he designed all this and I printed this all out on the 3D printer, <clears throat> including the truck side frames. Um, and this is basically, I have this running on, in standard gauge using a modified uh, G gauge uh, power truck. It's all plastic, but it's uh, it's one way to get those all those models that you could never get in the, in that scale, which is oh, it's, you know, good. Good. it's one of the uh, one of the fun things about the uh, standard gauges that you know the world stopped in 1941 pretty much, and uh, with the exception of a few modern era guys, uh, there's a lot of trains that had never been modeled in standard gauge. You can get any day of the week in, in O-Gage. Jim, the original of that thing is in the St. Louis uh, Transportation Museum. Yeah, there's, I've seen it. I've seen it there. I think the, one of the Rock Island ones. They laid it up. I guess the Rock Island guys, they, they hated their uh, their commuting patrons so much that they kept it, the aero trains and ran them until like 1966. Um, <clears throat> the thing was just basically bounced over the rails. This is a, uh, a lead truck from a GG1 that I'm producing now. It's, you can see it's aluminum castings, but um, I'm making patterns from the 3D printed parts and putting them on board so that they, they can be used as sand casting patterns. I, have, I work with a, an Amish foundry out near uh, Strasbourg that, uh, that does the aluminum work for me. So I can convert those plastic parts into, with a little more work, into a metal part. And uh, this is a standard gauge GG1 that I've, I've built nine of these now. Jeez. And the shell is a one piece aluminum. And these are some of the, there's, a, there's the truck you just saw. And the side frames are all cast. The rest of it's all machine parts from some other friends of mine. Uh, 
when you when you get to know train guys, you get to know guys that know how to do a lot of different things, as, as Chris mentioned. Uh, and one of my uh, buddies uh, works at an, an NC machine shop and machines these steel wheels. But this yeah. these all started out as um, yeah. as as um, as CAD models. This this model for the for the oh, GT1 yeah. shell was done by a uh, a 16 year old high school kid. Yeah, the yeah. What about the uh, TJ? TJ. TJ, can you mute your microphone, please? This is just another picture of uh, this was my my pilot model. Um, Clem saw it running at the uh, Chantilly uh, show. Um, so here's some parts that I'm, I've made for the uh, for the K4, the steam chest, and the uh, and the pilot. And this is what some of the parts look like when they come off of the uh, the uh, the resin printers, the, the liquid printers, um, they they might be partially transparent, but you know, like I say, I, I paint everything. So, but you can kind of get an idea of the detail that comes right off. Right, this is right off the printer. So this is another thing I'm, I'm building. I'm just about finished this guy. This is a uh, a McKean car. It's got a sheet metal body, but the roof was uh, was an aluminum casting that was made from a pattern of a CAD model that I 3D printed. <clears throat> and the side frames for the trucks done by that same kid that did the GG1. He devel developed the um, the side frame. And it, those of you that know the McKean, it has a little external flywheel to try to keep that ancient gas electric motor running. And that we included that detail. This shows the- uh, Here's the, beautiful. Here's the- um, the 3D printed part with some finishing, and here's the sand castings, which are a little rough, as you can see. I got to do some finishing, but that's that's the price you have to pay. And then a, a close-up shot of the side frame. The uh, the detail you can get with the with the resin printers is just astounding. Here's a picture of that um, Milwaukee road car. This whole back end is one piece. It's a 3D printed, like trans translucent plastic. I'll call it with a lot of masking to mask out all the windows. Those of you that know Bob Nelson, this is his, this is his train. And then sometimes you just got to modify things. Some of you, if you some of you guys, uh, the, um, the McCoy Cascade, uh, I decided I wanted a New Haven EP3. So the side frames are derived from the GG1, different headlights, printed these tanks, the central, this bolster up here, just basically heavily modified the engine to make it look a little more uh, like the New Haven. But, you know, uh, all 3D printing. Here's another one I did. Uh, so this is, those of you that are into standard gauge know what a, a 392E is. And so from the frame down, this is a 392E. <clears throat> Little modification back by the cab, the 3D printed boiler, 3D printed tender, and I have a, uh, a Pennsylvania E6 um, locomotive. So this one we ran at the uh, the 2019 SGMA in the Oaks. It's a side view of the engine. Tender shell, tender trucks, and the boiler fits right over top of the uh, of the 392 frame. Which, like I say, I have to have to grind out a little bit here where the cab came down on an angle. But aside from that, it basically plops, plops right onto the, uh, the 392 frame. Something I'm working on, uh, this is the rough print of, a, of an F7 diesel in standard gauge. This shows, um, this is shows what I have to do to get to a sand casting pattern. Uh, notice there's no windows. There's this detail that goes around. And there's a part that goes inside the shell core called a core that basically displaces the air inside that'll have this matching detail to hold it in place. So when they you imagine half of this is on one side of the board, the other half is on the other side, they have a split box, they pack sand on the one side, flip it over, pack sand on the other side, pull this pattern out, the board out, put in the core, and then they pour the metal down in there to create what comes out is basically just just the shell. 
So it's um, it's a it's a lot more work going from a 3D printed thing to a uh, a cast thing. But I'm gonna in this particular case, I'm gonna try to do that. And then this is a um, recent model I got from my German friend. It's the uh, it's the Pensy T1 4444 duplex. Uh, this one was I had to print this in three pieces and glue it together on my newest newest printer. But you can see this is. This is the, the detail right off of the uh, right off the printer and just no sanding, nothing, just uh, astounded at, at what this thing can do. So for me, like I say, I'm, I'm able to build a lot of trains that uh, were never done in this scale and share some of them. But um, it's really been uh, a blast. I got several other things that I've cut, kind of got salted away. You know, I, I collect these models from these guys and. Uh, then I have to get the hard work is getting from the CAD model to something you can run around your tracks. That's, that's all I got for today. Any questions? Yeah, Jim, do you have any information about what the resins are made of? Um, you know what? I'm not sure the chemistry of them. I mean, you buy the specific resin for the printer. It's It says 405 nanometers on it, which is the... I guess that's the frequency of light that that converts it from a liquid to a solid. Um, but I'm not sure, to be honest with you, what you know what polymer it is. Uh, sounds similar to what some dentists are using, uh, painting a a liquid on the teeth and then uh, curing it with ultraviolet light. Yeah, there's a, um, you know, I do some, some uh, uh, urethane, polyurethane casting too, and use the silicon molds. I know when I was getting braces, they, they had this goop that they put in your mouth, silicon goop, and it would cure like in, you know, three minutes or something like that. And they try to pull it off your teeth. Uh, uh, the, the, the stuff I use takes about two days to cure, but yeah, I'm not really sure what, what, it's, what it's made out of. The first machine that you showed uh, was printing from a, a ribbon of solid material, and uh, <clears throat> yes, the reel is uh, oriented so I can't read the word. It's 3D solutech and then a word hidden. Uh, it, I think it might have said clear or something like that. Uh, but that three particular, letters, what's that? C or T E R, and that's the end of the word. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure. I'm Could not you really mention sure. how much that machine cost? So this machine that uses the filament, I got for 400 bucks, and that included, you know, everything you see here except for the the, the spool of uh, material. It's called a Creality CR10. They've been making them for several years. The new ones are a little, a little more refined, and they're about the same price. Jim, what is the green material underneath your part? That oh, that's printing. That's tape. I this first print was lifting, so I tried to tape it down. Normally, I don't need that since I've learned more about how to keep things from pulling off the bed. One of the the key things with this technology is getting the first layer to stick. If the first layer doesn't stick, you can have a heck of a mess on your hands, especially if you uh, leave it run all night and come back and see what happened, you know? It kind of can kind of look like a uh, rat's nest, maybe worse. Thanks. Yeah, and what is, what is the materials cost for a standard gauge locomotive size piece? Well, like that, um, that shell I showed you, the T1, um, let's see, a, a liter of this stuff's about 30 bucks. I might've used a half a liter, so maybe 15 bucks worth of material. What okay. kind of glue do you use when you have to glue them together? I was using like uh, super glue. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, and stuff like, stuff like this. And you gotta work fast. I mean, I, you know, but you know, you just, one of the nice things you get on the resin printer is that that surface between the parts is like, it's like really, really flat. So you don't have to do much to get them to mate close together. So they, 
you put that glue in there and align it, and then you just better make sure you got them together right because it's it sticks for good. Thank you. I, I've used other glues. You know, it, it, it's uh, this is something called um, go-to glue that's clear, but it's you know it's it's a little thicker. Yeah, I use this stuff for everything, but uh, except for that, you know, close close mating surfaces, it's it's super glue. That's beautiful yeah. work, Jim. Thanks. Yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with it. It's uh, my wife wonders where I'm at, but she knows where to look. You know, I'm usually down here. Hey, yeah. Jim. There's a question here in the chat off to the side. It yeah. says, most of what we need are metal parts. Yeah. And 3D printers create strong parts uh, that will hold up like metal. Uh, well, it depends. The, um, the This filament printer is, uh, you can get some pretty, pretty tough materials for it. Um, the uh, the resin printer is a little the parts seem to be a little more fragile. My, my, like I say, my main use is just to use them as patterns for uh, for castings. You know, <clears throat> you do that conversion and now you're back into metal. There are metal printers out there that are still super expensive, where you can go straight <clears throat> straight from CAD to metal. Um, tricky business, but those are still I think the cheap ones are still over ten grand. So and the, and the material the the powder is not cheap either that they use. So, you know, it's. People are 3D printing guns out of filament. What's that? There are people that are 3D printing guns out of filament and they survive a number of, of uh, firings. Yeah, like I say, there's some, there's some tougher, uh, tougher plastics. I mean, I certainly wouldn't want a 3D printed machine gun. Even a metal one, I don't think you know. Um, so even the metal printers, the, the the parts are not as good as a wrought machine part. You know, uh, there there's some compromises there. At least at least with today's materials, anyway. <clears throat> 